Hi there, friend. This is Lee Posky. I wrote this message originally for our Facebook video fellowship group that we meet on Sundays. But this message in particular is so important, it's so powerful, it's so vital, that I felt that I needed to record this for the benefit of other saints. And so I also want to mention this message is only for God's born-again saints. This message is not for non-Christians. Well, last night in our weekly Bible fellowship, we were talking casually about righteousness. And at the end of our meeting, some of the saints express that they don't see righteousness as I do. While we all agree that our righteousness is, is entirely of Christ, I personally boldly proclaim that God has made each and every saint to be literally as righteous as he is. While others express that God sees us as righteous, my position is that God has made us righteous. He doesn't just see us as righteous. Therefore, we're going to focus exclusively on the issue of righteousness in this message. Last night before I went to bed, I prayed to God to please give us all discernment in this matter, all of us in the group. And wouldn't you know it, this morning, this very morning, the morning after last night's fellowship, God literally woke me up with these seven words. He will render unto man his righteousness. Those words were pulsating in my thoughts as I came to consciousness this morning. But I couldn't remember which verse they came from. So I sprang out of, out of bed and I went and looked up the Bible verse. And it comes from Job 30, 33, 26. It says this, He shall pray unto God, and he will be favorable unto him, and he shall see his face with joy, for he will render unto man his righteousness. I couldn't have asked for a better answer to prayer to pursue this study with than what God answered my prayer with this morning. So with that confirmation from God about the application of his righteousness unto his elect, let's go ahead and get into the study. Point number one, this is vital. Intellectual knowledge is not the same thing as revelation knowledge. When I approached this message originally, I intended to do an intense word study where every nuance of the word righteousness would be explained so that everyone could have a clear understanding of righteousness. But as I began, I felt very sincerely in my heart that the Lord was leading me to do this in a different direction. How did God reveal to me his righteousness as given to me? Was it by a word study? No. It was by revelation of his plain word, exactly as it's written in plain English. No commentary, no Greek or Hebrew exegesis. God simply revealed to me that he has made me to be his righteousness. And that same revelation is my desire for you to have, dear saint. So I'm going to write this message as I believe God is leading me to do. The first thing that must be understood is that intellectual knowledge is not the same thing as revelation knowledge. To apprehend an intimate knowledge of righteousness, just like in regeneration, it cannot be obtained with human intellect. I can show you verse after verse about righteousness, and I can present the Greek and Hebrew meaning of certain words about righteousness and things like that, and all you'll walk away with is lifeless intellectual knowledge about righteousness. Churches, assemblies are filled with these kind of teachings, and the people don't, don't have this sort of revelation knowledge that I'm trying to, to teach you about. Intellectual knowledge about righteousness won't make your insides bust open with excitement. Intellectual knowledge about righteousness won't have you screaming in joy. I'm the righteousness of God, y'all. I love it. It's so thrilling to be as righteous as God is, as a free gift. It's exciting. Well, if that kind of excitement is not thriving within you, you don't yet have full revelation knowledge of righteousness to the full. And don't worry, I'm going to get to scriptural inspection of righteousness. But first, it must be understood that revelation knowledge must be present in order for this gift of God to really click inside of you. You can study all day long, and intellectual knowledge alone will not do it. And this is the Achilles heel of proper religion is to try to replicate the wisdom and work of the Holy Ghost with inferior human intelligence. These are the same clowns who teach such respectable nonsense as progressive sanctification, dispensationalism, Arminianism, preterism, and Calvinism. So with that in mind, 
the foremost thing that I would, imp- would impress upon you to do is for you to intensely pray to God for him to quicken the truth of righteousness unto you. Pray to God about this like your life depends on it. In my own testimony, in my personal walk with Jesus, righteousness, the knowledge of, was the second major truth that God quickened unto me when he saved me. The first being completed forgiveness, and the third being completed sanctification. When God exploded righteousness inside of me, Romans 3.22 in particular just leapt off the page at me. And I've been mega excited about possessing God's righteousness as my righteousness ever since. In fact, it's even intensified over the years. Why do you think I have so many videos and articles about being the righteousness of God? It's because it excites me. I'll also add that righteous, righteousness means something in an intensely intimate way to someone when they've been abased by God. Have you been abased by God, dear friend? Like that publican in Luke 18? Have you been undone from within? Were you agonized over the wickedness that you are? Have you sought mercy in Christ in the gritty agony of your guts where you had to have his mercy no matter what? Have you been there? Well, all I can say is that's where I was prior to receiving his revelation of righteousness. Matthew 5, 6 says this, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Point number two. You must understand that righteousness is not connected in any way to our flesh. God does not play let's pretend. He doesn't put special Jesus glasses on so he can look at you in your sinful flesh. He sees you, dear saint, as perfectly righteous and perfectly holy because he's made you perfectly righteous and holy. The faulty understanding of righteousness that hobbles Christians from walking in the light of righteousness is to connect our permanently unregenerate flesh with righteousness. My wife Melissa's mother and Melissa's brother, both of them, for example, they've been heavily involved in the Baptist Assembly for decades. Her brother is even a deacon there. And they are perfect examples of how the religious mind simply can't see or enjoy the gift of righteousness. I've visited their church numerous times, and I've asked them, Do y'all ever celebrate being the righteousness of God? And all I get is crickets. They don't celebrate it because it's not real to them in a way that it's real to me. I suppose they subconsciously associate righteousness with their behavior, with their flesh. Thus, they don't celebrate being the righteousness of God. It's as simple as that. And that's how the natural mind tends to think about possessing righteousness. The natural mind always considers righteousness in one of two ways either in the negative, not relating to righteousness because we know the real us. We're very aware of the sin of our flesh, and so righteousness, well, it seems abstract or foreign. Or we approach righteousness in a positive association with our flesh. It looks something like this. Yeah, I'm not what I used to be, but righteousness is getting clearer to me as God helps me to put off the sins of the flesh. And friend, Both of those perspectives are entirely wrong. Neither perspective has any basis in biblical truth whatsoever. The wrongness of both of those perspectives is the association of righteousness with our unregenerate flesh. Point number three. God gave the free gift of righteousness because he requires it, and there was no other way for us to possess it. I'm going to explain this message of righteousness in the simplest terms possible because I want to help eliminate any misunderstandings about saints possessing the righteousness of God. Here it is, my friend. Righteousness in simple terms means spiritual perfection. Righteousness goes beyond sin, forgiveness, and holiness, all of which are components of salvation. But righteousness is the tip-top crowning jewel of all of those components. And we're not deity in any sense. We can't create righteousness We're not God. We're not little gods. We can't do anything. All we can do is receive. We can't can't, uh, create sin forgiveness. We can't create holiness in any part. We are merely the recipients of God's charity, the recipients of God's love. Here's the thing. God requires, get this, God requires that you be as righteous as he is to enter into the kingdom of heaven. In other words, 
you must be spiritually perfect to enter into heaven. Not almost perfect, not trying your best to be a good person. We have to be spiritually perfect for God to accept us into his kingdom. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 48, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. But our problem is that we're filthy by nature, and we can't fix what we are. We don't even have the ability to cleanse ourselves, let alone accomplish the greater task of attaining to, uh, of attaining to spiritual perfection, that is, righteousness. But the good news is that God already purposed the remedy for our problem. Among other things, Jesus brought in everlasting righteousness for us, for God's children. Daniel 9.24 Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. But self-righteous Jews, for example, didn't understand just how filthy they and their works really were, just like people do today who associate their flesh with righteousness. Behold, Matthew 5.20, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Romans 9.30-10.4 through 10, 4. What shall we say then? that the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not obtained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Sion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Let me pause there. And this is everyone's natural view of righteousness. That is, to connect one's flesh with righteousness. Okay, continuing. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. All of which is summarized perfectly in Romans 3, verses 20 through 22. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. Friend, do you now see how God requires perfect righteousness of you to be in his family? Do you see that? We're either fully righteous or we are none righteous. There is no in-between. There is no progression of righteousness. We either have God's perfect righteousness in total, or we don't have it at all. And the same thing goes for forgiveness from God and holiness as well. Our evil flesh and our inadequate works of any kind play no part in possessing God's righteousness whatsoever. Can you imagine visiting with Jesus right after his resurrection and asking him something like a religious person would ask him? Help me to understand, please. Did your finished work make me positionally righteous? What foolishness. Hear what the Spirit of Christ is saying to us in Scripture. Hebrews 10, 14. For by one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. What is that saying to us? In everyday language, that's telling us that God's gift of justification for us saints in Jesus' death burial, and resurrection, has made his set-apart elect children to be fully righteous, spiritually perfect before him. That's what's behind the meaning of he hath perfected. Certainly we grow and mature as we walk in the Lord, and our discernment sharpens over time and things like that. But our righteousness and our holiness 
are at full maximum from the time God regenerates us in Christ. No matter when you die, dear saint, if you're right in the middle of some embarrassing sin, or if you're in the middle of fasting and prayer, you are always 100% as spiritually perfect and heaven ready as you are ever going to be. Now notice how the Christian is made the righteousness of God as a free gift. Romans 5, 17 through 19. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men under justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. God made Christ sin for us who knew no sin. The words to be are italicized, meaning those words are not in the original text. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Listen to 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Not seen as righteous, made the righteousness of God in him. So our job is to believe the fact, to believe that fact in an intimate way. And when we do, our hearts naturally sing the song of Isaiah 61. For I, the Lord, love judgment. I hate robbery for burnt offering. And I will direct their work in truth and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. And their seed shall be known among the Gentiles, and their offspring among the people. All that see them shall acknowledge them, that they are the seed which the Lord hath blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. For as the earth bringeth forth her bud, and as the garden causeth the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all nations. Conclusion To proclaim that God has made us saints to be his righteousness is not bragging, it's humility and thankfulness. Because to express that, we're celebrating God's benevolent lifting us out of the dunghill from which we came. All right. God bless you, dear saints, in your pursuit of the knowledge of the truth. All glory to the risen Lord Jesus Christ and no glory to us whatsoever. Bye-bye.